book of Philippians chapter 3. I, I want to talk this morning about apprehending all that God has for you. Apprehending all that God has for you. Uh, it, it's amazing what God has already accomplished. As a matter of fact, if you work, look up the word have, H-A-T-H, it's a King James word, have, it, 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 it means that which has already been accomplished. That which already has been done. That's what has already been fulfilled. And matter of fact, it's, it, it's used over 400 and some times, 474 times in the New Testament, the word have, God have. And matter of fact, in Ephesians, there, so, there are so many times in just chapter 1, it, 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 for instance, Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Grab that. Now, I want you to see this. This is so important. Because really, it's like when God gave the land of promise the flow, that flowed with milk and honey to Abraham, it was over 400 some years later before the Israelites finally got to the, got to the Jordan River and God had already give them, given them that land. It was already theirs, wasn't it? How can God give it? Because he's the owner and the possessor of all things. God can give us anything he wants. And, and, and Paul said, by the Spirit of God, God hath blessed you with all spiritual blessings, all of them, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if he's given all of it to you, then what don't you have? You have it all. Uh, Jesus said, all power and dominion has been given to me. How much? All power and dominion. See, Jesus said, you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. So I want to talk to you this morning. I want to talk to you this morning. See, I want you to see this in a very personal, intimate way, though I'm talking to everybody. I want you to see this for yourself, say for me. See, really, if I can't get free, I'm not going to set anybody else free. If I can't apprehend all that which God has for me, then how can I help others apprehend it? And, and I've said this many times. I can only take you where I live. And here's the frightening thing. You, you ought to, not, not digging into people's lives, but really you, you ought to use a lot of wisdom who you follow. And you need to ask yourself, do you really want to go where they're living? Is that really someplace you want to end up? So if you've got a pastor full of unbelief, guess where he's going to take you? You've got a pastor full of sin, where is he going to take you? You've got a pastor who is very carnal-minded, where is he going to take you? you? You can only take people. You know, it's like parents when it says, uh, raise up your children in the way they should go when they're old, they're not depart thereof. Mom and dad can only take you where they live. That's where they're going to take you. So I, 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 I got to make sure that I'm headed in the right direction. I'm believing the right things. I'm doing the right things. I, I'm in the will of God. Because if I'm out of the will of God, that's... Now, don't misunderstand me. You can sit in a meeting and, 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 and not allow a person to take you where they're living, whether that's positive or negative, because you have choice. You choose. You choose. Do you want to follow? Jesus said, do you know the number way, one way that, that Jesus uh, recruited disciples? He simply said this. He said, follow me. That's what he said. Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. So Ephesians 1, 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So notice, he hath chosen us. We've not chosen him. God said, I've chosen you that you might go forth and bring forth much fruit. Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Say, I am accepted. If you're born again, washed in the blood, you're accepted. He hath accepted you. Notice the word have. Uh, Ephesians 1, 8, wherein he hath, uh, he hath abounded towards us. In all wisdom and prudence, having made known not to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the glory, the praise of his honor. So he hath accepted us. The word hath means accomplished. Do you believe it? Can you receive it? Ephesians 1.9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according 
uh, to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. I'm just emphasizing the word have here for a moment because I want you to see this is an accomplished work. Ephesians 1.22, and hath put all things under his feet. God has put all things under his feet and hath made him to be head over the body, the church. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. He hath. It's accomplished. Now, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it? Will he not do it? Has he spoken it? Shall he not make it good? So you need to realize something here. God cannot lie. Say, God cannot lie. What he says he has done, he has done. So then this brings us to, to another major aspect of life. Let me ask you something. What is the reality you are living in? What is the reality? What is reality to you? And when I say the reality of what you're living in, it, it, we all have a, a different kind of reality. I mean, my reality is different than yours in the sense of my wife is Kathleen. Uh, my children are Michael, Daniel, Stephen, Stephanie. My daughter-in-law's name is Yulee. I mean, I have a different reality. I'm a pastor. I have a different reality. We all have different realities that we live in. You might be a plumber, a carpenter, a housewife, a secretary. Them are realities that you live in. But there's another reality, and it's what we call the reality of the spirit and the reality of the flesh. The reality of the spirit and the reality of the flesh. Now, God lives in another reality. He's here. Wherever, where, God's everywhere, isn't he? He's omnipresent, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. He knows everything. Now, just because God's all-powerful, all-knowing, it doesn't mean he controls everything. That, that, the, the teaching of the sovereignty of God is totally messed up. God gives you choice. He not only gave you choice, he's given all creation choice. Let me give you an example. We got two cats at our house, Oliver and um, Felix. Now, Felix would follow me around. He was outside this morning, and we have a cat window, and I'm standing at the cat window, and Oliver turns around, and he looks at me. Oliver chooses to leave me alone. Felix sees me. He comes running into the house and begins to follow me everywhere, crying out for a bowl of milk. On and on and on and on. Well, why didn't Oliver do that? Because Oliver chose not to do that. Now, I know that sounds strange. See, God didn't make... Felix, come into the house and nag me, and he did get his milk, by the way. But Oliver chose to stay outside. Felix chose to follow me to keep crying out to where he got what he wanted from me. Did that just go over your head? Why did John have the right to put his head on the chest of Jesus and not Peter or James or Andrew? Or Bartholomew. Why didn't they have that right? Hello? They did have that right. They did not choose to. You chose to come to church this morning. To hear the word of God. But many chose not to. That's how God operates. That's how amazing God is. Uh, God will not make you do anything. You have to choose. He says, you will know the truth. Listen, you will know the truth. And we could stay on this all morning long, but we got a lot to share. You can know the truth, and the truth will. What truth? What God calls truth. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the light. I remember one night I was in here praying. Oh, God, show me the way, show me the way. He said, son, stop asking that. I said to the Lord, because I know it's God, because my mind doesn't formulate these, these, uh, these, these, um, the way these uh, visitations come. And he said, stop asking for the way. I said, why, Lord? He said, because I am the way. <laughs> he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. He said, I'm it. I'm it. I'm your answer. I'm your solution. I'm your remedy. I'm your antidote. I'm your healer, I'm your provider, I'm your protector, I'm your wisdom, I'm your righteousness, I'm your sanctification, I'm the rock you build your life on. He's it all. But you got to choose, don't you? So your reality could be spiritual 
and I'm going to use as a believer carnal. See, there, 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 there are within the body of Christ those who are spiritually minded and carnally minded. Now, the word carnal, you know, sometimes we get a real negative perspective. Oh, you just called me carnal. Carnal, no, just simply means to be naturally minded or you're thinking on the level of the flesh. That's where your mind is operating. That's where your mind is functioning. When, when you look at things, you don't, you're not looking through the eyes of God. You're looking through the eyes of flesh. Now, Jesus, he didn't look through the eyes of the flesh. Now, I'm not talking about being a crispy critter Christian. And, and, what, and what I mean by that is I'm not talking about just imagining things in your mind. I've got a really good friend of mine, and, and I would never mention his name, and he's a well-known author, and, and, and I've tried to read his books, and a lot of it is nothing but a figment of his imagination. I know it. I'm not judging his heart. I, 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 you know, I just, you know, because I don't see the results. I don't, I, don't see, I don't see the evidence. See, people ought to see the evidence you're hearing from God. They, they ought to see it. Uh, our LED sign went out here years ago. And I finally, you know, I thought, well, I need to get this thing fixed. And I called a local sign dealer that we bought it from. And they said, to get that sign fixed, is going to cost you about $2,000. I said, Lord, I don't want to pay $2,000 to get that sign fixed. And so I waited for a year just talking to the Lord about it. And then here just uh, about not even a month ago, I, I really perceived in my heart, look for someone you can buy the part from directly. So I found someone up in New York. I ordered a part. It was $1,100. Well, that's, you know, almost a thousand dollar savings. I thought, well, OK, we need to do this. People need to know what's going on here. And not that that is going to get them in here. But if people are hungry, they're going to take notice and it might bring them in. Fine. We're here for hungry people. That's what I'm here for. I'm here for hungry people who want to know the truth. And, and so we, we got the box and the part I had to replace. It didn't look like it at all. So in the beginning, I'm thinking, oh, man, I got to send this thing back. What am I going to do? And I thought, well, why don't you pray? And it kind of like came up in my heart, you fix the sign. I thought, okay. See, I don't ever say no to God. I say, okay, Lord. And so I went out there, and I ripped, and it's complicated. I ripped, and I got a hold of the company, and they said, well, the part we sent you is the right part, but the old part, it, 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 to make a long story short, they really couldn't help me. And so the, I began to strip stuff out of the sign. <laughs> I just, you know, I put, took out the flare unit. I took out the CP unit. I took out wires, and I'm clipping away. I didn't know where I was really going, and I put it up, and I caught them up, and they gave me the wrong directions. And I thought, okay, well, here we go, and I began. And when I first turned it on, sparks flew, and it should have burned up the CPU, an $1,100 part. And I, I said, oh, Father, don't let it be burned up. And I said, what do I need to do? And, and I'm, to make a long story short, praise the Lord, it's up and running. That's evidence that Pastor Mike was hearing from God. That I don't know. It's not something to brag about that you hear from God because the Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the we us. That means the mature sons. The more mature you get in the things of the Spirit, the louder God's voice and direction becomes in your life. I got a book back there, How God Leads and Guides 20 Ways, and it's filled with nothing but evidence of how God has led and guided me through the years. Well, Pastor, why does God lead and guide you? Because you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. See, so, what, so a lot of people are living in a realm. So let me ask you something. As a born-again, spirit-filled believer, right, what is your reality? Is sickness or healing? Defeat or victory? Poverty or abounding? Forsaken or never forsaken? I just feel like God has forsaken me. Well, you just called God a liar because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Did you hear that? Man, that ought to set you free. Well, I just feel like God doesn't hear my prayers anymore. Well, God said, call on to me and I will answer you. So it, it, people, I just, I, just don't, I just don't feel God's love. Well, love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. See, what God is wanting to do, he's, God is wanting to bring you to where he lives. God wants, that's what it's all about. God wants to bring you to where he lives. He created you to walk with him. 
to know him, to have intimacy with him, to be one with him. That's the last thing Jesus prayed. Father, and I'm so glad every prayer that Jesus prayed always gets answered. Now, the prayers of Jesus won't take away my choice. And if I choose, Enoch chose to walk with God before he was ever born again. And he walked with God and was not. So if Enoch, who was not born again, washed in the blood, the sacrifice of Christ had not been physically accomplished, though he was slain before the foundation of the world. Now stop and ask yourself, the Bible says Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Do you know why? Because whenever God decides he's going to do something, it's done. That's who God is. When God says, you know what? I'm going to create man. He's going to have to be redeemed. And you know what? He talked because there's the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And he says to the Word, which became flesh eventually, he said, Word, you're going to become flesh and blood. And you're going to take upon yourself the sins of the world. And you're going to go to the cross. Don't worry. I'll raise you from the dead in three days. And the Word said, yes, sir. And he was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Because what God said he means, and he means what he said, and God can not lie. And upon this foundation, I can grab a hold of every blessing, every promise, every provision in the new covenant. It's a new covenant. It's yours. I said it's yours. You ought to be really happy, man. If your cell phone just won and you were told that you won $5 million, you'd be jumping and shouting, listen, Five million is, is a drop of water in the ocean compared to what God has already given you. Are, are you this is Bible. Say Bible. It's Bible. It's not somebody's deep theology or, or revelation. It is Bible. And a lot of people don't really mean, mean it, but they actually are calling God a liar. They don't mean to call God a liar because they're operating in the reality that they are living in. And matter of fact, what does the Bible say? In the last days that many, Paul told Timothy, many will be turned away from the truth onto fables. They'll be turned on to make believe. Listen, this is my reality. I hope it's yours. And it's becoming more of my reality every day. This is my reality. And my reality is, what did God say? My children were raised in this reality. I, I know how children think. Uh, you know, we had a Christian school here, and before, I, you know, I was a child at one time. You know what? How, my, how, how I thought as a child, where my children live, the reality that my children know is completely different than the reality I knew. The reality I knew was nothing but flesh. It was Lying, cussing, swearing, drinking, doing drugs, living in a morality darkness. My children never known that reality. You know why? Because we didn't raise them with that reality. We, we raised them in the reality of this book. And so God wants you to apprehend all that he has for you. So we can take a look at that in Philippians chapter 3. And uh, notice what it says here in verse 7. But what things are gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss in all things, and do count them but dung. So I want you to see that Saul lived in one reality. He was a Pharisee, he, 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 he was highly educated, but one day he had an experience with Jesus. Say Jesus. Come on, how many of you have had an experience with Jesus? Okay, and guess what? His whole world was rocked. His whole life was changed. That old reality, that old man, that old wineskin died. And Saul became a Paul. He stepped into a new reality. February 18th, 1975, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, getting ready to slice my wrist, weeping, crying. The fear of God hit me. I fell to my knees, and I cried out to Jesus, and I got up off the floor, and I had become a new man, and I entered into a new reality. 
that has a new language, that has a new vocabulary, that has a new mindset, that has a new attitude, that has a new perspective, that has a new outlook. And I began, and the only way I could learn it was in the Bible, and I grabbed it, and I began to discover this new world that I had become a member of. He has delivered you from the power of darkness and has translated you into the kingdom of God. So my desire and God's desire is to bring you into that kingdom, that kingdom reality where you are healed, where you are more than a conqueror, where you can do all things through Christ, where no weapon formed against you can prosper, where all your prayers are answered and all your needs are met and you're living high on top and you're looking down on the problems of the world, where you laugh at adversity, you laugh at cancer, you laugh at lack, you laugh at the lies of the devil. I said you laugh at them. I said you laugh at them. Even though your body says otherwise, even though the circumstance says otherwise, even though all evidence says otherwise, you're living in that realm where Jesus lives, where he walked on the water, turned the water to wine, fed the multitudes with a small handful. Here about five years ago, you know, it was a middle of winter and our attendance had dropped way off, and it was cold in the building to some extent. And one Sunday morning, we received our offering, and, and I looked in there, and, 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 and people had given 20s. And I thought, well, that's a lot of 20s. There was about maybe 20, uh, 30 20s in there or something like that. And I went home the next morning. I didn't count it that night, and I got the money laid out in front of me. And I lay my hands on the money all the time. And I said, Lord, I'm not looking to the money in this basket. I'm looking to you to meet our needs, to take care of the bills, to keep us going because you raised us up. You put us here. It's not, it's not something I did. You did in spite of me. And so I thought, well, I'm going to count them out in $100 piles. So I counted out one pile of and the 20 is just sitting there. I counted out one pile, and there was 100. I counted out another pile. It sat there. I counted another pile, and I noticed the pile didn't go down. The back of my neck stood up. And I counted out another pile, 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 and I counted, I just, I'm sitting there watching divine multiplication. Boom, 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 boom. And I think I got to look into the pile too much because after 22 piles, it stopped. And then there was another winter, and some of you were here, and we had a 1,000-gallon takeout back of LP, and, and I, many times it had run out through the years. And one morning I came in here, and I could smell, I could smell the LP, the garlic in the air. And, and I went out, and the tank said empty. It was on empty. And I laid my hands on the tank, and I said, Lord, I said, one or two things. Either you're going to have to bring in the money in, or you're going to have to keep this tank supplying the fuel. How I many know tanks don't supply the fuel? It's not like a cow you can milk. So I laid my hands on the tank and I said, now, Lord, I thank you that we got to have church this morning. And I came in. That was before we had wood stoves or now the uh, pellet stoves. And I turned on all the heat and they kicked on and it ran that whole service, that whole service. Sunday night, it ran. Thursday night, it ran. The next Sunday morning, I told the congregation, I said, I want you all to take a little journey with me. So about 15, 20 of us marched outside. And, 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 and well, why didn't you go into a smaller room, Pastor Mike? I just, I, I felt like in my heart, no, if I'm going to trust God, because we see this place packed full. Do you see it packed full? I see it packed full. <laughs> I see it full of hungry people. Not religious people. And so we marched out through the snow. And, and I believe that day it was blowing. And we looked and I said, look at that gauge. And they all looked and they said, Pastor, it's empty. I said, I know it's empty. I said, we're going to keep marching out here every Sunday. And we're going to look. And for two and a half months, we all would march outside every Sunday morning and look at the empty gauge on that LP tank. And God just kept on supplying our needs. Give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> See, he have already done it. It's already accomplished. See, you already were healed. <laughs> you already were healed. Yeah, but pastor, but what? But my flesh, yeah, you're right. But the devil, yeah, you're right. But the circumstances, yeah, you're right. But God says... Now, I'm not telling you that you can just decide, okay, I'm healed. Okay, pastor, I I'm going to see if this works. Forget it. You can't see if it works. you got to know it works. 
You got to know. You got now. And we're going to get into this in, in more detail in just a moment. But I, I want us to go on here and take a look what it says here in Philippians. And, and this is so powerful because he says, uh, and be, in verse uh, eight, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the ex- excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered a loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found where? Where are you going to be found? In him. You're found in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It says, not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of the what of Christ? The faith of Christ. The righteousness, which is of God by faith, that I may, what, know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of the suffering being made formable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, now as I had already attained, either already, what, perfect or mature, but I follow after, if that I may what? Apprehend. Say apprehend. Apprehend. So Paul is telling us here that he has apprehended many things from God, but he has not yet apprehended all things. Now, if you got born again, you apprehended the born again experience, didn't you? If you're not born again, you can apprehend that born again experience. You're never going to get born again again. Being born again is not a feeling. It's a spiritual reality that when you believed in your heart that God sent his son Jesus, he lived in this earth, he took your sins, he died, he rose again, and he ascended to the heaven. And the minute you believed that he was the way to the Father, and you said with your mouth, first you believed in your heart, you said with your mouth, you got born again. Now, you might not have even felt like you were born again. Because being born again is not a feeling. (laughs) Y'all see this? It's not a feeling. It's a declaration of what? Faith, isn't it? Trust. Confidence. Now, Lord, I, I did what you told me to do, and I, I'm just going to, and I believe that, uh, that, that, that it's like when a woman gets pregnant. When a, when a woman conceives in her womb, how long is it before she can physically tell that she is pregnant? Did you know that there's been stories of women who carried babies to the whole term and never even knew they were pregnant? They never felt it until all of a sudden one day contractions hit them. They ran to the hospital and said, something's wrong with the doctor. Something's going on down there. I'm just, I don't know what it is. And the doctor lays her down and examines her and says, oh, you're about to give birth to a baby. <laughs> Hello? I hope we're going to, I'm going to try to buy it, try to bring you into this reality where all things are possible. How many want to go to that place? Now, when I say all things are possible, I'm talking about all things that God has for you is possible. That's what I'm talking about. His will be done, not my will be done. So I want to take you to a place where all things are possible because all things are possible to those who No, no, go to church. Read their Bible. Pray. No, those who believe. I mean, no, you can go to church your whole life. You can read your Bible your whole life. You can pray your whole life and not believe. That's scary, ain't it? You know, and, and so it says that, that he, he says that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of the sufferings, being, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as I had already attained, either already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So when you got born again, you were apprehended of Christ. You became his. But here's the other side. Now you've got to apprehend him. You can have the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost may not have you. How many of you got the Holy Ghost? But does the Holy Ghost have you? You have Christ, but does Christ have you? See, there's a a big difference there, isn't there? Listen to what he says. 
Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What are those things that we are forgetting or that we are leaving behind? You know, you know what it is? It, it, it's the old reality. Forgetting the old reality. In, in the old realm... I never laid hands on the sick and believed they would get healed. I never told devils to come out and they came out. I never cried out to God for a financial need to be met and it was met. I never loved my neighbor. I never loved people. I never loved God. I never, I, it was me, 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 me. Yeah. Those things, those old things, that old reality, that old Mike Yeager is dead and passing away. How I used to think, how I used to talk, how I used to live, how I used to act, how I used to speak, what I used to do. Man, my children have never seen that old Mike Yeager. Thank God. Hallelujah. He needed to be buried. What do you think water baptism is when you get water baptized? You're going under the water and you're saying the old reality is dying. I'm coming into a new reality. See, God's trying to bring you into a new reality, a new realm, a new dimension, a new place where all things are possible for you. That's where God's trying to bring you. So why don't you cooperate? The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro upon the face of the whole earth to show himself strong on the, on the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect towards him or are in agreement with him. Are in agreement with him. If two be not in agreement, you know, the only time my wife and I are not, do not have peace in our marriage is when we don't see things eye to eye. We, when we don't see it the way, same way. How many you know? That when a husband and wife don't see it the same way, there's friction, honey. There's strife. There's problems. There's, right? I mean, if you don't see it the same way, well, what is it that brings a husband and a wife together? You know what brings us together? The Word of God. See, really, we don't really, even though I've written over 40 books about Smith Wigglesworth, and the reason why God laid him on my heart, because he was just a plumber who was like most of us, just a natural man, but he went into a realm where most people will never live. And you know how he did that? Do you know how Smith got into that realm? He started to agree with everything that God said. <laughs> Jesus said, I only say that which agrees with my father. So I'm going to, I don't, if I agree with the devil, uh, really what I don't realize is I release demonic powers on myself. The very first book I ever wrote back in 1996 called The Chronicles of Micah, War in the Heavenlies. And I described this young man by the name of Micah. It was me in my first three months of Christianity. And it's filled with supernatural events. And in this book, I explain every time I agreed with God, angels would hearken to the word I spoke and they would go to work for me. But every time that I agreed with the world, the flesh, or the devil, demonic powers went to work and the hands of the angels were tied and they could not help me. Now, whether you believe this or not, it is a reality. It is a reality. So I think I told you one time that this was back in 1981 or 1980 and I had already started memorizing many scriptures just for I could agree with God. And one morning I got up to try to quote a scripture and I couldn't. And I said this, I said, man, honey, I said, I don't understand. I said, I know that scripture, but I just can't remember it. Next thing I know, there was another scripture I couldn't remember. And then another, and within two weeks, I could hardly quote any scriptures. And one day I'm in prayer and I'm frustrated. I'm saying, God, I said, I don't understand what's going on. I, I said, I, I, I can't remember the scriptures and I heard the voice of the Lord I'm an inner man my inner man he said this to me he said oh son he said I can tell you your problem I mean it's like I'm here I said what he said you're just simply getting what you're saying I said no way he said oh yeah yeah you've been agreeing with the devil and so the demonic spirits have the right to come and rob you they have the right because you gave them the right 
You are getting what you're saying, son, whether people, not people who say this is cultic teaching. Well, then you're calling Jesus a cultic leader because Jesus said, you get what you say. I'm telling you, Jesus said it. You know what? I'm going to believe Jesus no matter what. I had somebody come to me last week, and they basically said, Pastor, you know everybody's saying you're a cult here. I started laughing. I said, I don't care what they say. I agree with what Jesus said, and I get the results that Jesus got. And I, so, and, and, and you know what the Lord said that to me? I repented. I said, Lord, I repent. I said, I repent for saying that. Lord, I've got the mind of Christ. I, 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 I've got the Holy Spirit that brings all things back to my remembrance. And right then and there, it's like somebody turned on the spigot. And all of those scriptures that I had supposedly unable to quote came flooding back inside of me. Give the Lord a hand clap. See, this is another reality. Well, carnally minded people, you can't take them to this place because they won't, they, they will not agree with this teaching. They will not agree with what the Bible says. And why, why would that be? Because the devil, he's got to keep you out of that realm of faith. Yes, it's faith. It's faith in God. What do you think? Hebrews 11, where there's 50 amazing realities. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And this is where God wants to take us. So how do I apprehend all that God has for me? How do you get saved? How do you get filled with the Holy Ghost? How do you get healed? How does God answer your prayers? By faith in him, confidence in him. See, I'm totally convinced when Adam was created of God and God breathed into Adam the breath of life, I'm convinced that breath of life was the spirit of faith. I'm totally convinced now. It was the spirit of faith that God breathed into man. You know the greatest danger to the demonic world? You know what it is? It's faith. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our what? Faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. How do we overcome the world? By faith. In who? In Jesus Christ. How do you overcome, Pastor Mike? By faith in Christ. See, people don't understand what faith was given to you for. Faith was given to you to acquire the divine nature of God. Faith was given to you to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Faith was given to you to fulfill the will of the Father. Faith was given to you. Faith caused you to draw nigh to God. See, it's faith. What caused Adam and his wife to run from God when after they committed sin? A spirit of unbelief had gotten into them. They heard the voice of God and, 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 and fear. For the first time, they experienced demonic fear. And they ran from God's presence. Well, you know what faith does? Faith causes you to run to God. I, I remember there was a short period of my life where I really went through a lot of problems after I was saved. And for a very short period of time, I ran from God. And if I would have died in that condition, I would have been in terrible state. Didn't last very long. And one day I had this visitation from the Lord. He showed me. I saw myself go out, get drunk. I saw myself fall down into a gutter. And I saw myself with demons coming into me, I saw in a dream, and I saw myself becoming worse than I was before I got saved. I woke up with a cold sweat. Now, that was the fear of the Lord on me. He said, son, he said, stop running away from me. He said, run to me. He said, because I'm the only one that can give you what you need to overcome. And from that day forward, I have run towards God. Even if I mess up, even if I goof up, even if I give in to the devil in some stupid Mickey Mouse way, I'll repent real quick. It takes faith to repent. Amen. Say repent. <laughs> See? And so I learned that faith was given to me to run to God. Now, every child is born with faith in their heart. Every child is conceived. He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Do you know why there are so many abortions going on in the world? You know why? It's not because really people hate babies. You know what it is? It's the devil. And you know what he's threatened by? He's threatened by the faith that is in their heart. That little child within the mama's womb 
If its faith is developed, if that faith grows, if that faith takes a hold of God, if that faith matures, he could be another Paul, he could be another Peter, he could be another Catherine Coleman, she could be another Smith, uh, another, another uh, Mary Woodworth at her. It's the faith that's in that, you know what the greatest threat to the devil is? It's not your good looks. It's, it's not your Ph.D. or your doctor divinity or your, or your education or the color of your skin or the job you have. The greatest threat to the devil is the faith that is in you. Listen, when Christ who is our life, see, the, this is our reality. See, this is a believer's. When Christ who is our life, you shall appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you shall appear with him in glory. Well, these are powerful truths, so let me ask you something. My reality is Christ. So, if we be dead with Christ, what does that mean? I'm dead to the old reality. I'm dead to it. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, before I got born again, I mean, a spirit of fear possessed my soul. I mean, when as a little boy, I slept in the basement with my brother, and I was scared to death of spiders. I mean, spiders scared me. You know what? When I got born again, I was delivered from the fear of spiders. They don't scare me no more. But you know what? Even after you're born again, if you don't apprehend by faith that you don't have a spirit of fear, you can be driven by a spirit of fear. You, you know, I'm telling you, this really happened to me. I, I've had some really alarming problems in my body in the last 40 years. And about two years ago, three years ago, I'm up front and I'm praying and I heard the Lord say this to me. And that shouldn't be weird. You should hear, you hear the voice of God all the time. You may not know it. You heard the voice of God this morning that said, go to church. You did. Your flesh didn't bring you here, honey. <laughs> God brought you here. Tell somebody, God brought you here. See, that was faith that causes you to run towards God. And so the Lord said this to me. He said, son, do you know why I heal you all the time? And I said, and I've learned to say, no, Lord, I don't, because otherwise he wouldn't ask me the question. <laughs> I had taken years for me, because in the past I would kind of tell him, he said, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And I finally shut up and say, okay, God, tell me. I've learned just to say it right away. He said, whenever he says to me, son, do you know why? I said, no, Father, teach me, because <laughs> Father knows best. He said, and this is what he said to me. He said, you know why I heal you every time? I said, no, Lord. He said, because you're not afraid to die. Well, what does that mean? You know how I many people are manipulated by the medical world, the insurance world, governments, because they're afraid to die. And they overcome them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they not love not their lives unto death. I'm not afraid of being a failure. I am what I am. I'm not afraid of dying from a disease. I've had people stand there with a gun to my face. I've had people try to stab me to death. I've had people try to burn me to death. I've had it, but I don't have a spirit of fear. See, I'm in another realm because in the old days, I was afraid of every little thing. I was afraid of the dark. I mean, my uncle Warren, he was afraid of cancer. And he was a big husky man. And when he died, we had a closed casket because he had cancer had ate him away with, with, with the uh, radiation treatments. I'm not afraid. I, 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 because faith in Christ, not my Jager, faith in Christ has moved me into that realm where you can't threaten me. I'll laugh at you. I've done it in the past. Now, I can get out of that realm. I can go right back to that old carnal fleshly realm I used to live, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> I've got a freedom I never knew existed. I've got truth that has set me free. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of poverty. Because Paul said, I've learned when I'm a base, I'll be a bound. And when I'm hungry, I can be full. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
See, this is the Christian reality, people. This is the reality where God wants to take you. So uh, let me just say a couple more things before we close. Before Adam committed sin, the faith in his heart was like our sun in the heavens. And what I mean by that is self-perpetuating. It just, the sun just keeps burning. If God would determine, that sun would burn throughout eternity. We have no idea where the energy source is coming from. That sun just keeps, well, that was the faith that was in Adam. But when Adam committed sin, his faith become, became like a campfire. What do I mean by that? How many know that you can have a wonderful campfire, but what will happen to that campfire if you don't keep feeding it fuel? It will die. Dying you shall die. If you don't keep feeding your faith the truth, if you, if you put water on that campfire, if you put a wet cloth over that campfire, if you put dirt on that campfire, it'll die. Faith is dying in many people's hearts today. It's dying because they're throwing the wrong stuff on it. The Bible says protect your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. And here the faith that God has given you, it's going to die if you don't feed it. You know, the Bible actually said it's going to be so tough at the end of the ages that it says we should even come together even so much the more. Now, where should you go? You should go where somebody is going to build your faith in God, your confidence in God, your trust in God. That's where you ought to go. Somebody is going to build you up and not pat you on the back and say, oh, you poor thing, you, you got such terrible arthritis, and, and, and let's, just, let's just believe that the doctors are going to find a cure. I have found a cure. Yeah. Well, what do you know about arthritis, Pastor Michael? I know a lot about it. It tried to hit me in my 30s. It hit my sister Debbie. She was a tremendous typist. She could do 160 words a minute. And you know what? Her fingers began to get gnarled. And I tried to encourage her, well, let's come against that. It's a spirit of infirmity. Let's take authority over that, Debbie, and let's begin to praise God. If you don't know how to believe God for healing, I've got three books back there and telling you how God heals. It's there for you. People get offended at this. It's there. Yes, you've got to be educated. You've got to be taught. But if you right away, a spirit of unbelief will come up because you've been taught wrong. Well, you know, Pastor Mike, it's not God's will to heal everybody. Matter of fact, God gives some people sickness and disease to heal them. And I said, well, that's strange because Jesus healed everybody that was oppressed of the devil. There wasn't one person that came to Jesus that he didn't heal. And he, Jesus is the brightness of the glory and the express image of the Father. But... Listen, you don't understand this, man. You've got preachers in a pulpit that is pouring on belief into people's hearts. Now, don't get me wrong. If you've got to use the doctor at this moment, fine. But let's get you to where you don't have to. Can you receive this? Do you like, Take by faith. Take by faith what I'm saying. Well, pastor, I know Brother Pete, he was going to a spirit-filled church for seven years, and he came here, and he sat, and he had, pastor, I never heard this kind of stuff. In a Pentecostal full gospel church, I'd never heard this kind of stuff. I said, well, I don't know where they're living, but I know where I'm living. <laughs> and I'm not, and it's not that I'm living in Copeland land or Hagen land or Lester Summerall land. I am living in Jesus land. That's where I live. There's things those guys say I don't agree with. You know why? Because Jesus didn't say it. It's not Pastor Mike said. It's Jesus said. Jesus said. Come on. If you're not impressed with Jesus, I'm never going to impress you. I will never impress you. If Jesus can't, if, Jesus, if you won't believe what Jesus said, I can't help you. And so many times when I began to sit down with carnal-minded Christians, and I said, well, let's see what Jesus said. And their eyes were just like glassy. I, could, I said, well, I, I really can't help you. Why? Because you don't agree with what Jesus said. Basically, you may not know it, but the spirit of unbelief is so strong in you, you're calling Jesus a liar. The spirit of our belief. See, that's why I don't deny the sickness when it hits me. I get plenty of opportunities, but I deny the right for it to exist. I take authority over it. Jesus said, whatever you bind will be bound, and whatever you loose will be loosed. Well, I've got I've to find the devil who's behind all of this. No, I already know the solution. I got the antidote. I got the remedy. 
I've got the name and the authority and the power and the nature and the character and the life and the blood of Jesus. And he's the resurrected Lord. Wow. Remember the woman? She had suffered many things from many physicians and she was now poverty stricken. Hello. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Many, many. And one day she heard Jesus. If I can just Get a hold of the hem of the garment of Jesus because there's healings in his wings. I will be made whole. You know what? She got a hold of Jesus without the Father showing him who the woman was. Why? Because it was for our example. Jesus didn't even know who touched him and she got healed. <laughs> Why? Because it's all by faith. So your faith is like a campfire and, the, and it can become a raging bonfire. No, when you got born again, that see, the faith already had to be burning in you before you got born again because you apprehend salvation by faith. Now, let me just, let me, man, there's, tonight we'll pick this back up if, if, you, if you come back tonight. It's not that I don't have faith. It, it's just my faith cannot make you do what you should. My faith cannot make you do. I can cry out to God that he'll pull back the veil and show you the truth that he'll give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and a knowledge of him, but my faith cannot make you do what you should. My faith will not make you pray. Now, God, God, through your prayers, God could get a hold of me. My wife did that one time many years ago. She saw that I was being kind of cold and lukewarm, even though I was ministering to many people. And one night I came home late, late from counseling. And uh, I found out most times counseling doesn't work 90% of the time because really what people need to do is renew their minds. They need to see it the way that God sees it. See, that's what faith is. So we'll, we'll get into that. An adult human contains trillions of cells of more than 200 types. Trillion. Your body is made up of trillions of cells. All these cells, plus the many, many more cells that are shed throughout the year, can be tra tracked back to the fertilized egg. Now listen to this. The one cell that can ultimately create every type of cell in the body. One cell. When you were conceived in your mother's womb, you were a one cell creation. Now listen to this. One cell. And what did this one cell do? It began to multiply. It began to replicate. You have 200 major types of cells in your body. Trillions of cells in your body. During the first 12 hours after conception, the fertilized egg remains a single cell. After approximately 30 hours, if the cell is working right, it divides from one cell into two and 15 hours later. So in 15 hours, approximately, it says 30 hours, it divides from one cell into two and 15, hour, and 15 hours. The two cells divide into four, and at the end of the day, uh, at the end of three days, the fertilized egg cell has become a berry-like structure made up of 16 cells. So in three, in, 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 in three days, that one cell, you were one cell, becomes like a gel, and now there's 16 living different cells. And those cells would keep multiplying, and they would eventually become 200 specific type of cells with trillions and trillions of cells. So, Pastor, what does this have to do with this? I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart that what it is in man that causes us, it says there's a spirit of man. There's a spirit of, of God in man. What is that? It's a spirit of faith. It's a spirit of faith. And we have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I've spoken. We therefore believe and therefore we speak. It is a spirit of faith. If you rip the faith out of your heart, you will never receive anything from God. Are you listening to me? And what does the devil want to do? He wants to kill your confidence in God. Your trust in God. When I work, you know, when I'm, when I'm full of worry, I'm not in faith. Now, you can't attack somebody like that. You got to help them. Say, don't attack. Help. So I want to help you increase your faith. Above all, take an issue of faith wherewith you shall be able to uh, 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 quench all the fire darts of the wicked. So, uh, so I told you last week, your faith is like your body. Your faith has a heart. Your faith has 
eyes. Your faith has a nose. Your faith has hands. Your faith has feet. Your faith has a mouth. Your faith has a brain. And as I began to pray over this, I'm going to show you what I'm saying. The very first thing, now listen, if that cell, that DNA is working in my life the way it should, as, as conceived in my mother's womb, they're very, how many know what's the very first organ that that cell begins to make in a baby? What's the very first organ? The heart. The heart. The heart. You know what the heart represents? Love for God and people. It doesn't first produce the hand that grabs. It produces the heart. So listen to me. The very first thing that we should be teaching people when you get born again, okay, now let's take that faith and let's do this with it. Take a hold of loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength, and being and loving your neighbor as yourself. This is so vitally important, people, because a lot of times, like Pete says, we get the cart before the horse. The very first thing your faith ought to go for is loving God. I'm going to love God. That's what I did. I didn't realize it at the time. I used to have a target up here and in the middle of bullseye, and I had this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and being. Yeah, how many know if your heart dies doesn't matter about the rest of your life. If, 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 if you speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, you're becoming sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. If you have to get the prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if you have all faith so that you can move mountains and have not love, huh? it profiteth you nothing. So love is what your faith ought to go for. I'm going to love God. Use your faith. I don't know how to use your faith. Well, let me ask you something. Do you really know how to use your brain? But you do. You don't think, now how can I use my brain? You just do it. Use your faith to say, Lord, your first commandment is you're going to love God with all your heart, soul, my strength, and being. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to love. I'm going to love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all my being. And I don't know if there's been a day in my life I didn't say that to the Lord. Lord, you made me to love you. I'm going to love you. It says the love of many shall wax cold because iniquity shall abound. You can have faith without love because you never went after the heart of God. You never went, and matter of fact, most likely, if you haven't developed a love for God, you're probably most likely all caught up in yourself. My problems, my circumstances, my hardships, the symptoms in my body. I'm not mocking you. I've been there. And let me tell you something. I know that I know that I know that every time I took the faith that God had given me, and I said, you know what, Lord? I really don't care what my body says. I don't care what the circumstances say. I don't care what people say. Lord, I'm going for your heart. I'm going to love you. You made me to love you. And Lord, if anything, I would die loving you. I'm going to love you, God. So take your faith and begin to use it to go after loving God. See, the devil, he, he doesn't want you to grab a hold of the heart. Why did God use David? Why did David operate as a king? Because David had a heart after God. Oh, we know David had faith. David slayed Goliath. He killed the lion, killed the bear. And, and matter of fact, I can prove to you, he kept the heart of God. Because after Saul died, David wept when he could have rejoiced. But faith says, oh, Saul, he died, and it broke his heart, because that's the heart of God. So the very next thing that faith apprehends is what we call hope, or it's eyesight. Now, by the faith, hope, and love. See, there's nine major parts that need to be in our life. Faith, right? The heart of God, the eyes, the hands, the feet. The ears, he that has an ear, let him hear. He that has eyes, let him see. What are you seeing? See when, when you, I, see, when you begin to love God, all of a sudden your life explodes with hope. With hope, you get hope, you get hope. It's a vision, it's a dream, it's a purpose. Jesus said at 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. 
I mean, I've heard all kinds of teaching on faith, and, and there's reality to a, some of it. But I tell you what, we've been missing it big time, because if the body of Christ would use their faith to take a hold of loving God, let me tell you, all of the other parts would come, all of it. Patience, works, grace, huh? obedience, it all would come. Your eyes, faith gives substance to what? Hope. What, see, if you can't see it, you can't receive it. Hope's got to see it. you got to see. By, see, I see my, I know this sounds weird. I, I learned this. I mean, I taught this subject back 30-some years ago. I, I saw having not seen yet believing. Abraham became the father of many nations who against hope believed in hope. What did God do to Abraham? He said, Abraham, you've got faith now to follow me. And that's what he did. He said, Abraham, you're the father of faith. He said, your love for me took you out of the city of the Chaldeans. Listen, your love for God is going to take you out of the darkness, out of immorality, out of perversion. Your love for God, that's why you got to use your love for God. Your love will take you out of that, 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 that realm of wickedness. It'll take, you, it'll take you into holiness. It'll take you to God. Faith will take you to God. Your faith will take you to God. Your faith will take you to God. Your faith says God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm going to seek God. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith says I'm going to seek God. I'm going to love God because he first loved me. He deserves all of my life. I'm a debtor not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if I live after the flesh, I shall die. But if I through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the, of the flesh, I'll live. What's, how do you, that's the spirit of faith. How, what, what is it when he says through the Spirit you mortify your flesh? Faith in God. Faith in what God's Word has said. Faith. I'm telling you, everything I have, I've apprehended it by faith in Christ. So now God takes Abraham out. He's got a, a faith. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. And it takes him out into the wilderness. Loving God took, how many has love, love, love for God ever taken you into a very dangerous environments? It has for me. Among the communists, among the gang members, among the Yupik Indians. It's take love for God. God said, go. Son, go. I wish I had more time. I don't, so we'll close this up. Faith takes you where nobody else will go. To reach people nobody else will reach. Love for God. Your love for God. And then he says, Abraham. He said, he didn't tell him this. He said, now, Abraham, the next thing I got to do is I got to give you hope. So he said, Abraham, look up in the heavens. You see all the stars? Yeah. He said, that's the number of the seed of your descendants. Now he's without a child. That's, that's the number of the seeds of your descendant. He said, you see the sea by the shore, by the shore as the waves are coming? You said, yes, Lord. He said, now I want you to see this. He said, those grains of seed represent the number of children you will have through the generations. And Abraham believed it. He showed him an object lesson for him to see it. What do you think the parables are? The parables are designed to develop your faith in God. And yet the modern day church is ignoring the parables of Christ. Ignore, the very thing that God gave us to develop our faith, we're ignoring it, most, most people. So then Abraham, he sees it. He, see, he sees, oh yes, God. Now he saw, he, he, of course he compromised, went to Ishmael, because he listened to the wrong advice. And it took him on a dead-end road. Watch it, for you don't end up on a dead-end road. Your whole Christianity, you're trying to please God. You're trying to love God. You're trying to serve God. And you end up way out there in, in, in no man's land. So here Abraham, he finally sees it. And he says, okay, I believe it. Sarah's 90, I'm 99, it's okay, no problem. We're going to have a child. That child is going to have children, children's children's children, okay. So let me say this, this is how faith works. Nobody ever taught me about healing. I didn't hear Copeland, I didn't hear Kenneth Hagin, I didn't hear E.W. Kenyon, I didn't hear Or Roberts, I didn't hear nobody. I'm in, uh, and I was born with a lot of infirmities of my body. And one day, I've got my Bible open, 
And I discovered Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. I discovered Matthew 8, 17. I discovered 1 Peter 2, 24. I discovered, and, and then, uh, and I said, Lord, I, it says, Lord, I'm healed. It says, uh, you were healed. Now, I'm not very smart, but you were healed. It says, you were healed. And at that moment, I saw that healing was for every human being for every person, in every situation, in every situation. I saw it. I've been walking in that reality for over 44 years. Amen. It's mine. I saw myself healed before I ever felt it, before I ever experienced it, before I ever had flesh and blood for it. I just knew that I knew that I knew in my heart I was healed. It's the same thing with every promise. You got to see it, people. How can I see it? Take the word of God and paint the picture. Well, if I don't see a manifestation of what's going on, pastor, the devil is lying to you. He's telling you God is a liar. and You can't really believe it until you feel it, until you experience it, until you physically have it. You'll never get it that way unless somebody's operating in a gift of healing or miracles or in faith. And God does do that, by the way. I prayed for many people who, had, who weren't even saved and God healed them. Many people through the years. But you know what? The day would come when they're going to have to begin to believe God for their own. They're going to have to trust God for their own. I, I remember a story Kenneth Hagin told. He said his son, uh, Ken Jr., was in his teenage years and his son Jr. got really sick. And he went to pray, his, lay his hands on his son Jr. And the Lord said to him, he said, uh, I'm not going to heal him this time. I'm not going to manifest my healing. And Kenneth Hagin said, oh, Lord, why not, Lord? He said, it's time for him to take a hold of it. Really? He said, yeah, you've taught him. You've taught him how to believe me. And so he told his son. He said, son, it's your turn now because my hands, when I've laid them on you, I've gotten you healed all these years, but it's your turn to take a hold of God and get your healing. And you know what Junior did at that time? He agreed with his daddy. He said, okay, dad, you have taught me how to take a hold of healing. I'm going to take my healing. And guess what? He took his healing and God healed him. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout.